Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, I feel like one of the things that we do is just keep revisiting old themes and sort of on this permanent rotation. And I literally think it was like basically a year ago. I think it was was exactly a year ago. We did an episode on (laughs) the rising price of grains, particularly corn, wheat, and soy. And since then, uh, let's just say we have to revisit that now. Yeah. Well, we were just talking about this, but I think a year ago, you know, the theme was the weather hasn't been that good. Crops haven't been that good. Food prices are rising. China is buying a lot, and that's adding additional pressure on supply. And now we have to throw Russia, Ukraine into the mix. And it just seems like a pretty bad situation has possibly gotten a whole lot worse. Right. And so when people think about the commodity effects of that, uh, of the war, of that conflict, I think predominantly people think about oil and gas. And of course, we have seen upward pressure on both. But Ukraine is also a massive exporter of wheat. Belarus, which has also come under sanctions, is a big exporter of uh, fertilizer. And so we have had this already tight market for commodities, for grains, for some of the conditions Mm -hmm. you mentioned, and they've just gotten a lot tighter. Yeah. And of course, the one thing that I'm sure Odd Lots listeners know about the commodities market by now is that everything tends to be interconnected. So if you get a rise in the price of natural gas, for instance, that can end up feeding through into the price of fertilizers. I saw one news story right before we came on saying that um, Yara, which is one of the big fertilizer producers in Norway, uh, is curtailing its production of fertilizer because of the nat gas price surge. And then you have things that happen in the commodities market that feed through into other commodities. So uh, again, another example here, the price of wheat is expected to increase production of pork because, of course, a lot of pigs in Europe in particular eat wheat as their food grain. So everything's interconnected and it becomes really difficult to predict and track a lot of these movements and impacts. Exactly right. Well, you know, we mentioned that we talked about this uh, a year ago, and so we are going to bring back the guest we spoke to before and try to wrap our heads around what is going around now because The one other difference is that anxiety about inflation overall much higher Mm. today than it was in early 2021, even as we started to see these prices rise. So complicated time, complicated situation. I'm very excited to bring back Scott Irwin. He's an agriculture economist at the University of Illinois. So, uh, Scott, thank you so much for coming back on Odd Lots. Um, My pleasure. Really look forward to it. Absolutely. Great to have you back. Let's start with actually right before the invasion. Just talk a little bit about how tight or how would you characterize the conditions in the grain market, you know, sort of early February 2022. We were kind of scraping along. Uh, Prices were certainly elevated relative to historical averages. Uh, The latest thing that the markets had absorbed was a less than stellar growing season for South American soybeans, but we were getting along, anticipating a pretty good spring and big plantings of uh, uh, corn and soybeans here in the the United States that would probably help smooth that out. We're going to have some volatility, maybe related to summer weather here in the U.S., but I wouldn't say that, you know, we thought that anything was way out of bounds historically. So how big a deal is Russia invading Ukraine from a grains or agricultural perspective? Because on, on the one hand, you, you hear a lot that the Ukraine in particular is you know known as the breadbasket of Europe. There's a lot of production there. But on the other hand, farming is an industry that is familiar with supply shocks, you know, things happen. There's, um, I guess, bad weather and and pestilence as well. So how big a deal is this? Um, Couch it in historical terms. Sure. This is the way that I try to communicate just how big of a hole this war is blowing in the global grain markets. The Ukraine 
uh, in recent years has planted about 59 million acres of their top six crops, wheat, sunflowers, soybeans, corn, barley, and what they call rapeseed. Um, so how big is that? And that's what's under threat of potentially not being planted at all uh, this spring due to the war. That's almost exactly equal to the total planted area of crops in Illinois and Iowa. Huh. So you're just blowing that right potentially out of global markets. Imagine that. Now, they're, they're not as productive. Those acres don't grow as much as uh, Iowa and Illinois do. But, you know, that right there is about 4 billion bushels of production that potentially, if it doesn't get planted or the vast majority doesn't get planted, uh, you're just taking that off. Uh, you know, so that's just the immediate war impact. Then they have on the other side, Russia, they're not going to probably have, you know, any problems growing their crops this year. The question is, uh, how much of it will be available to the world markets? Russia is the world's largest uh, exporter of wheat. And again, the way I try to put that into perspective, well, you know, with U.S. production, what um, would it take for U.S. wheat production to replace what's lost potentially for Russia? Well, Kansas is our biggest uh, winter wheat producer here in the United States, and it would take four million Kansases wow. to replace what was lost. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's quite a striking way to put it. You know, we're recording this in the middle of March. Actually, recording date is out March 14th. Where are we in the cycle? And so you talked about plantings in Ukraine right now. What needs to happen? Like, are we talking about in the next couple of weeks? Where, where exactly is the timing of this? In the Ukraine and Russia, their um, biggest wheat crop is winter wheat, which was planted last fall. It uh, basically goes into hibernation in the winter, and then it's plant and it's harvested in the early summer. That that's already growing in both countries. Uh, then the question is, how much of it will be um, available to be harvested and moved into international markets in the Ukraine? But the the really big danger is the number one crop in terms of volume in the Ukraine is actually corn which the vast majority of it is exported uh, internationally. Uh, Ukraine exports now over a billion bushels of corn every year. Huh. And the planting window in Ukraine for their spring crops, it's almost the same as the United States. It's not really very much different. They will be planting in April and early May. So they're really literally just a couple of weeks from going back, or they would intend normally to go back to the fields uh, in a couple weeks. So we've seen the price of wheat shoot up really dramatically, and the price of corn has gone up too, but not as much as wheat. What exactly accounts for the discrepancy there? Well, because uh, combined, uh, the Ukraine and Russia is a significant component of the total exports of wheat in the world. Uh, number one, uh, Russia's number one, and Ukraine, off the top of my head, I think they're second. When we think about wheat, where does it go? What is the end destination of wheat look like? And Tracy mentioned something that in Europe, uh, the pigs eat wheat. I mean, how much is bread? How much is pasta? How much is feed? Mm. What is the ultimate distribution? And what kind of substitutability is there between grains such that if the price of wheat soars, then the end buyer can maybe switch to a cheaper commodity? For feeding animals, for livestock feeding, there's a great deal of substitution. Basically, there's the potential for 100% substitution if you have those supplies. Where there's real concerns is, you know, the vast bulk of wheat is actually used for human consumption. Uh, bread, pasta, crackers, things like that. This is potentially huge problems for, you know, lower to middle income countries in right. North Africa and throughout the Middle East that have relied very heavily on them. They're, imports of wheat from this area. And that's almost all for human consumption. Egypt is kind of the uh, prime example. 
you know, Joe mentioned the um, substitution effect and the idea of people, you know, maybe instead of wheat, you use something else to feed your pigs. But could you walk us through exactly what happens when you get a price shock like this? Like, how does it filter through the broader market? So prices increase. And then do pig farmers immediately start deciding to feed their herds something else? Uh, Do farmers respond to the price increase immediately by altering their planned crops? Like what exactly is the sequence of events that happens? Well, all of this is really going on at the same time. And this is one of the reasons why in this kind of circumstance, you see just such incredible volatility or spiking of prices in wheat because uh, of the nature, what I would say is the natural inflexibility built into the consumption side of commodities like wheat, corn, and soybeans in the very, very short run. Uh, On the animal side, yes, there's some short run substitution in terms of feeding, but that takes some time. And, you know, the animals that are there have to be fed something. So this is the heart and soul of the source of what economists call the short-run inelasticity of demand for agricultural commodities. So on the animal side, the animals have to be fed, and there's limited substitutability. You know, you have to get different suppliers, commodities have to be moved around in terms of this substitution. It will happen but it just takes time. And then that's even harder on the human side when, as we know, diets are relatively fixed and you know, countries like Egypt will do everything they can to probably try to increase subsidies and insulate their population from these price increases. But if wheat is simply not available in a place like that, that's a huge problem. There's, there's really, besides aid from other countries, uh, it's very difficult to change that diet in a matter of a few weeks. Okay, so you walk through, we get this price surge, what happens on the the consumption side. What happens on the supply side? What are, A, is there still time for farmers in the U.S. or anywhere else to change their choice of crops or to reallocate acreage? And is there anything anyone, whether in the U.S. or elsewhere, can do to increase supply overall in a short to medium period of time? What is the opportunity to replace the lost the lost wheat? A great question. Uh, in wheat, uh, unfortunately, kind of in a devilishly tight situation here because the biggest wheat crop in the world, as I mentioned before, is winter wheat. And for the Northern hemisphere, that was already planted. And there's just nothing you can do now in terms of increasing the winter wheat supply in the northern hemisphere of the world because that planting window was last fall. Now, the southern hemisphere can, uh, you know, begin planting winter wheat right now. uh, And there are some large producers like Australia, but the southern hemisphere doesn't tend to be, you know, that large of a wheat producer. So maybe we'll get some more out of that. But you know, that's, you know, six, eight months down the line. So the short run on the wheat supply is all going to be with spring wheat. Um, And there is some scope for the ability to expand production of spring wheat, but spring wheat tends to be grown in far northern areas of the Great Plains of the U.S. and into Canada. And, uh, So there'll be probably some increased production there, but it can't show up until at the earliest September. Mm. So, you know, uh, that's the vice that the wheat market is in in the world is that our ability to basically really alter availability is through the channel of spring wheat, which is a relatively um, minor crop compared to the major crop of winter wheat. So that makes it hard. Uh, You mentioned Russian winter wheat at the beginning. And of course, you know, that's expected to still grow and probably be largely um, unimpacted by the events in Ukraine. But 
no one can get to it or fewer people can get to it because of the sanctions in place. What are the chances that some of that is able to leak into the market? Well, that's going to be the great question because we know, you know first off, there's what economists call trade diversion in these kinds of situations. Um, you know, not everyone is going to follow the sanctions. For example, we expect that um, some of Russia's wheat exports will now go to China so that they can use that to feed their feed their animals and contribute to their diets. So that's trade diversion will happen. The big question in my mind is always leakage that, you know, um, not speaking to the morality of the situation, but we know that historically that large international commodity trading firms are experts at figuring ways uh, semi-legally is the way I would put it, around the sanctions and to move these commodities around the world. Yet, there's a cost to that. You know, that they, they'll only buy the wheat from Russia, deep discounts. It takes time for these alternative channels and uh, legalities to be worked out. And so, inevitably, you know, trade diversion and leakage can't offset the full effect of the sanctions and what you know we're all trying to figure out and that's what the market has to assess in real time you know well what's that leakage and a different trade diversion going to look like so we mentioned it at the very beginning in the intro but when we had you on a year ago i think it was about a year ago the story at the time seemed to be about very aggressive Chinese buying and uh, building up stocks, building up buffer stocks. And I think I saw a stat recently. I, I, I forget the number. I'm not sure how many years worth of wheat China currently has. But since you mentioned that China is likely to be a destination for whatever uh, wheat gets out of that market, uh, out of the Russian market, what is the state of Chinese buying? Is it still in accumulation mode? Has it balanced out the stocks? What kind of deficit or position is China in right now? I have to admit that we're all looking through the glass darkly in terms of China's uh, grain reserves. And that's an official state secret. And so everybody just guesses at okay. it. Uh, uh, so my perception is that they have done uh, quite a bit of reserve rebuilding, but at the same time, they're in the phase of rapidly rebuilding their animal herds. And so in that race between increasing consumption oh. from their animal herds versus their rebuilding, uh, nobody really knows. But I do know that they've been back in the uh, grain market for U.S. supplies in a big way in the last couple of weeks, which everybody's expecting. Uh, what we have seen for 2022 before the uh, Ukrainian crisis was that uh, China's soybean buying was back to basically the trend they were on before our trade war, which means it's huge. Uh, they weren't buying as much corn in 2022 as they did in 2021. Um, it had backed off some uh, that I suspect that they'll be back closer now in 2022 now than they had planned because of the uh, lack of availability of Ukrainian supplies. But uh, that story remains to be written. This might be a very basic question, but if supply is constrained and, you know, everyone in the world presumably wants to keep wheat prices relatively low so that the price of bread doesn't go up too much, uh, China is still buying um, large amounts. How does existing supply get allocated? Could we see a return or even more sort of food supply nationalism and the idea that people are going to be keeping more of their own crops closer to home? This is the great danger in global grain markets right now, Tracy. Uh, this is what I'm most concerned about, which 
History shows that when you get in these huge, scary price spikes, particularly for a food commodity like wheat, that there's a tendency for a bit of panic to set in and countries begin shutting off exports to uh, basically protect domestic supplies and protect domestic consumers. And that really leaves uh, importers, particularly importers in the not rich countries, out in the cold. And we're already seeing that kind of bing, bing, bing beginning to happen. And so if you lock up supplies in some, it doesn't take very many exporting countries, <clears throat> then that really makes prices for everybody else uh, explode and puts more of the burden on generally poorer importing countries. And that's where things politically get really explosive. And so that's that's a real concern that I have because the market's going to do its job. The market's job is basically to <clears throat> run the price of wheat up high enough that you ration current demands enough so that the globe has something left over at the end of the year. The problem, you know, but in order for the market to do that job, somebody has to get priced out of the global market. And the job of trade is for the market to then spread around available supplies to, um, to the highest bidder. And some people that as a policy matter that we probably don't want priced out of the market can easily get priced out of the market as the market does its job. So that's what happens in the very short run. And the other side of the market's job is to run the price up of wheat high enough that as we can expand acreage and production to adjust to this, that the supply responds. And it will happen. It always does. But it's, you know, can take a year or two for this kind of shock to fully be absorbed and we get the supply response in terms of expanded acreage and production around the world. So the shocks from this are going to reverberate for some time. Yeah, there's so many follow-up questions I have to that. You know, but the first one, when price of oil and also gas, but when the price of oil surges, it immediately becomes a political question and people start turning to elected leaders. What are you going to do about this? What can we do to, say, increase exploration or drilling in the United States? Or what can Germany do to cut off its uh, reliance from Russian uh, gas, et cetera? Are there policy levers that countries, whether rich or poor, can pull here? But I'm thinking in the United States, for example, is there something equivalent? Is this is there something for the USDA or the White House to think about doing during such a time of high prices and tight supplies? Well, there is one that could be considered uh, in the United States. Uh, we have something that's called the Conservation Reserve Program in the United States that currently contains 22 million acres of previously cropped land that has been taken out of production, presumably because it's uh, most uh, environmentally sensitive in terms of wind and water erosion, uh, or it has biodiversity, really a lot of it's uh, right. for pheasant hunting. Uh, so there's that acreage that could be considered for maybe a special one-time exemption from the current long-term contracts that are required to place acreage into that reserve. So we have an acreage reserve, something like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that is at least could be considered. Uh, it's very controversial, as I found out when I suggested it a couple of weeks ago. But basically, my argument is pretty straightforward, and you can hear it through the conversation we've had today. I believe this is the largest supply shock of my lifetime uh, in global grain markets uh, if the conflict continues and severely harms planting in the Ukraine. And so we need to at least look at extraordinary measures like this here in the U.S. Uh, the EU is ahead of us. They're already 
um, apparently making plans to make their what they call set aside acreage uh, available for production this year. And those policy means you might think, oh my gosh, well, you can plant this spring, but we don't get that until next fall. But the markets will react to those moves now because the markets always are in an anticipatory mode. Right. And yeah. if they see that there's going to be somewhat more supply than they would normally think, that will have an impact now. And so yeah. that's uh, uh, in the EU and in here in the U.S., those, those are pretty much the only policy levers that, that we have. No one has huge uh, grain stocks piling up in warehouses anymore like we used to say in the 1980s nobody has those so the only thing we really can do is try to juice up uh acreage this spring wait could you walk us through exactly why this is so controversial because i did see some people on twitter who were pushing back and you know initially if someone says well the price of wheat is going up a lot. There might be food shortages. Uh, let's increase acreage. It sounds like a very like good thing to do, but I imagine there are those environmental concerns and, and other issues with it. So what are those exactly? Well, there's what I would call a, uh, you know, there are the environmental concerns and then there are the practical pushback on, the, on okay. that idea. The environmental is these are supposed to be a highly erodible acres and less productive acres that are put into the conservation reserve. And there's no doubt that that is true. And so you're not getting your, your prime acres, most productive acres put in. And so if you took them out, people say it, it wouldn't be that productive. My counter to that is the USDA has actually done some great work tracking parcel by parcel what happens to acres in the past as they've come out of the conservation reserve because it turns over. There's acres going in every year. There's acres coming out without getting into all the details. But over time, the acres that come out, um, over 80% go back into crop production or some kind of annual crop. So it, it, it can be used. So that's the, the one biggest is, you know, these are supposedly our most environmentally sensitive acres. So why would we want to um, mess with them? And then the other point is, you know, that those acres uh, have biodiversity uh, benefits uh, in particular, as I said, for recreation and animal biodiversity. And so those benefits are, are there. And in my mind, probably the bigger concern is the practical. It's very, very late in the calendar to for farmers to adjust their plans to try to farm those acres. Um, you know, if even if you do try to farm the CRP acres, you have to plow up something that is in grass. Uh, can you get the seed right. and fertilizer that you need, even if you want? To, to do this. So, so there are some very significant practical concerns to doing this, but I'm a big believer as an economist. I mean, if there were ever incentives in place to do what uh, one of my old professors at Purdue, Earl Butts, was famous for saying when he was secretary of ag uh, in the 1970s in the Nixon administration, he was famous for when that price spike went so high that farmers would plant fence row to fence row. And the incentives are in place uh, to go fence row to fence row. And, um, you know, and the, and the other is a policy consideration. You know, the, there will be differences of opinions about this, but these are extraordinary conditions. And I think going towards what you said, Tracy, maybe we should consider doing what we can even if it's not our most productive acres, maybe if it won't make a huge difference, but, but why not do what we can yeah. to address these supply issues, even if they're not going to make a huge difference. But, you know, even a few hundred million bu extra bushels of wheat in this country could go a long ways uh, to spanning the gap in places like Egypt, potentially, as we go through the next year. So that that's my counter argument to those that criticize that idea. Uh, that was great. 
And uh, <clears throat> that was a very interesting answer. I want to continue on the supply side aspect of the question because you mentioned, okay, is the fertilizer going to be there? And again, it's something I think about with, say, oil, which is that even if there were some sort of you know impulse to uh, explore more oil, there's a lot of tightness in labor markets at the oil patch. People uh, talk about the shortage of steel pipes and the shortage of frac sand. What are, you know, even prior to this crisis, how have shortages in general and uh, tight labor markets, how are they affecting the farmers that you speak to in uh, the grain area? Mm. And what kind of uh, scarcity of other commodities and labor uh, make the supply side perhaps uh, less rapid? Or how much of a challenge would that be to mm -hmm. scaling up uh, more production? Uh, excellent question. Farmers I've been struggling on the labor side like everyone else, uh, but I haven't really heard that that would be a significant constraint. You know, uh, farmers being farmers, they'll just work extra hours to get it done yeah. if they have to. The bigger concern is the availability of fertilizer and uh, herbicides and pesticides that they need. I think farmers were counting on all that working uh, before the Ukraine crisis. And I think that was a reasonable position for the U.S. because we don't actually import that large of a proportion of our fertilizer, probably 15 percent. So, so I think that what we needed was probably in place in the United States, but it was a little iffy. But right now, um, when I talk to farmers, they're very nervous about just getting their uh, chemical, uh, chemicals and fertilizer supplies now. No one seems to be giving them firm answers on anything. So huh. that's, that is what I'm hearing. I think the supplies are there, but everything is just in such turmoil that uh, that's, if there's a place for a bottleneck, that is where it's going to show up this spring. Uh, I believe that for the planned acreage that we had before the Ukrainian crisis, that the vast majority of the supplies are there and they will eventually get through. But it makes one a little, uh, I think, a, a little sketchy how much we can expand beyond that, even with these great prices, uh, from what I'm hearing uh, from farmers. What is the situation with fertilizers at the moment? Because, you know, as you mentioned, it, it seems like it's difficult to get information on supply potentially, but we have seen some impact in the market already. And even before Russia actually invaded Ukraine, there's a lot of talk of tightness in that market. Oh, clearly. I mean, we saw starting last fall that um, nitrogen fertilizer prices just spiked uh, to, um, you know, extraordinary price levels, you know, um, more than doubled. And, and some of that is just, uh, demand side and natural gas prices were spiking, which is the primary in input for making nitrogen fertilizer. So, you know, we were already struggling with extremely large increases in production costs, particularly for corn uh, here in the United States. Uh, so uh, that was already a major topic of conversation here in the in the Corn Belt. It seems like there's two, at least a couple of factors on the fertilizer side. There is the high cost of energy. And I think Tracy mentioned in the beginning that we saw some fertilizer companies in Europe, just say, oh, we're not going to produce right now because it's not economical given the high cost of natural gas. And then right. my understanding is that Belarus itself is a uh, a huge exporter of either fertilizer or one of the key ingredients to fertilizer, maybe. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, the sources of constraints and particularly the, uh, the Belarus angle? Well, right. Um, you know, Russia through Belarus is, you know, a, they're a huge adder exporter of potash right uh you know one of those things that we never talk about you know again for the united states that's probably not a huge uh issue even though if we would could you lose 10 or 15 percent of your supplies you know that has an impact but that's 
potentially next year, a major issue for a country like Brazil, which imports most of its fertilizer. And so that's, you know, the the difference. Uh, I do not know the uh, import percentages for for Europe, but I suspect they're also very tightly tied to the Russian and Belarusian supplies. And, you know, and it, you know, and it, one of the things that I find terribly interesting, a little factoid about how this stuff filters in, one of the Formula One Grand Prix uh, teams is actually, or was, sponsored by uh, one of the largest Russian fertilizer companies, and his son was a driver on a Formula One team. And last week, it was announced that Formula One kicked him out. Oh, I think I saw that headline. I didn't. I didn't make the connection of what was going on there. Yeah, they're they're one of those companies, and they were <laughs> sponsoring a uh, Formula One team, uh, the Haas team, and uh, you know they've canceled the uh, Russian Grand Prix. Uh, and uh, kick the uh, uh, fertilizer sponsor from Russia out of out of the program. I mean, it doesn't have much to do with this, but it just shows right. how extraordinary and how fast moving these events are right now. I want to go back to things that can be done about the situation. And another thing that I've seen floated recently is this idea of maybe suspending incentives for renewable fuel production. So that would mean, you know, less corn being used for stuff like ethanol and more of it going into actual food production. How feasible is that politically and practically? Uh, super question and something that, you know, I've been talking about in the last week. Um, it's a little bit complicated, so I'll, but I'll try to be really condensed in my answer. Short answer is that waiving the ethanol mandates here in the United States, I don't believe would have hardly any impact on the uh, use of ethanol um, in the United States, which means it wouldn't have any savings in terms of corn bushels. And the reason is that ethanol has now become the cheapest source of octane available to gasoline blenders. And so without intending it to be, we ran an experiment about waiving the mandates and what would happen to ethanol use in the Trump administration through something called small refinery exemptions. And that huh. was effectively waiving the mandate, and we didn't use any less ethanol. In fact, it grew a little bit as we waived the ethanol mandates. So I, I think that that's, that would have no impact on corn usage. So the ethanol side of the equation in terms of uh, our biofuels policy, it, to me, is a non-starter. It doesn't get us anywhere. Huh. And, it, and it would have the follow-on effect of likely raising the price of gasoline uh, a little bit, at least, and maybe noticeably. So I call that a, a robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, policy response that doesn't really get us anywhere. Where it's more interesting, those ideas, and and doesn't get discussed enough, is on the advanced or biodiesel, renewable diesel side. We are currently going through a boom in world veg oil prices through a boom in building what are called renewable diesel uh, plants. Long story. But even there, if we waived those uh, parts of our uh, RFS mandates. It's not very clear if it would have much impact because the largest policy subsidy for renewable diesel is not coming through the um, the RFS, our national policy. It's coming through the low carbon fuel standard in California. So to have really any guarantees, you want to take pressure off of world veg oil markets, you have to waive the California low carbon standard and the RFS at the same time. That, that doesn't seem likely to happen particularly uh, 
the California one. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the the effect of the end consumer? And so, you know, people don't eat wheat typically. They eat bread or they eat right. pasta. And I've seen some claims that, you know, in the end, like, the actual wheat is not a huge source of uh, the uh, a cost of a loaf of bread or whatever it is. How much do these huge swings feed through to the uh, price of finished goods that uh, consume wheat? Again, critical point to understand. Um, uh, here in the United States, on average, the cost of what a consumer buys in the grocery store for food only about 15% is represented by the cost of the raw commodity. So if you take a dollar of food expenditure, 15 cents is the raw commodity. Even if that doubles, you know, you go from 15 to 30 cents, that's 15 cents on a dollar. You know, it's noticeable, right. but it's not doubling because right. uh, you have that pass-through effect. Um, you know, and in terms of the retail food price inflation, the number one factors are, one, uh, price of fuel, basically crude oil, because uh, it's exp we have to move all this food around from producers to consumers. And then number two, wages, because of all the processing that goes on. So those are the biggest determinants of retail food price inflation. Although you are certainly going to see added cost push inflation from these raw commodity price increases as well. But here in the U.S., you're not going to see, you know, 50 percent food price inflation because the price of wheat's gone 50 percent for that reason. But that's not true in countries like Egypt, where wow. those those pass throughs are much closer to one for one. I have one last question just based on that. Finally, like on this policy question, should rich countries think about aid to poor? I mean, that seems to be the recurring theme that we keep coming back to is, okay, U.S. Uh, reasonably insulated. Yes, prices will rise. But obviously, as you just mentioned, there isn't anything close to a one-to-one -one, uh, pass-through. We're probably not going to have outright shortages in the U.S., but for poorer countries, Egypt and elsewhere, food rise in food prices can have seriously, uh, obviously, devastating health consequences, devastating political consequences, consequences for stability overall. From a policy perspective, should uh, leaders in rich countries be thinking about that, about what can be done uh, with our own wealth or with our own stocks to ameliorate some of the uh, negative effects on the countries that can't as easily afford these uh, price swings? Absolutely. And the number one policy lever that should be pulled there is to the degree possible to persuade exporting countries not to hoard their supplies right. exactly when they're most needed on world grain markets. That's number one, to try to stop that kind of beggar thy neighbor right. dominoes falling. That's number one. Number two, if there are ways to increase food aid where we can, that's important. And number three, th this is a longer term response, but uh, we we know that the best way is to continue supporting uh, the growth of agriculture in these poorer areas, that's the number one way for their economies to develop and to um, become more uh, self-sustaining in some of these key commodities areas. So support for de their domestic agricultural producers is really important. For example, you know, you got to be really careful, we've learned, Joe, that, okay, yeah, we have this emotional response and we want to uh, really help poorer countries. And so we kind of dump food aid in there in the short run. Well, that just destroys the livelihood of farmers in those countries. Huh. So it's 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 not as easy as just give them a lot more aid. Well, uh, Scott Irwin, always fascinating to catch up with you. And like I said, like we said in the beginning, it seems like infinitely more complex than the first time we chatted. But uh, thank you so much for coming uh, back on Odd Lots. Yeah, I really always enjoy it. 
and uh, hopefully added a little signal and not too much noise to the conversation. <laughs> no, absolutely. That was, uh, it was very useful, and uh, I learned a lot from it. So thank you. Yeah, that was great, Scott. Thank you. Tracy, I always really like uh, speaking with Scott. It, it does feel like something like a wheat shortage. Here we might look at a screen and see a rise in prices. But and this is a theme that comes elsewhere. There's sort of a very – there's a difference between a rise in prices and then places just not being able to get the actual commodity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something that we actually wrote about for the Odd Lots newsletter recently, this idea of the difference between the financial realm and the physical realm, which is something that it feels like the world is very much waking up to at the moment. But I also like Scott's nuance on the point of wheat prices in the US and the idea that, well, if the raw material goes up a lot, that shouldn't necessarily translate into higher prices for things like bread and pasta, because a lot of those are going to be driven by larger input costs like labor and energy. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, energy prices and um, perhaps labor as well are also going up. Right. So it's not exactly uh, much consolation necessarily that the price of bread <laughs> no. isn't entirely determined by wheat, it's just determined by everything else and the price of all those things. Are up. You know, it's interesting. Uh, another theme that continues to emerge is how bifurcated or how fragmented a lot of these markets are. And so, you know, as, as, as Scott mentioned, in the U.S., we might be in decent shape from a fertilizer perspective. It might be tight. It might be a little bit more expensive. Whereas for a country like Brazil, which he noted is extremely reliant on imported uh, potash, uh, mm. that could be a, to a totally different story. Of course, it would all come back around and uh, connect, and then you'd have global prices. But it is interesting to think about, you know, the U.S. relatively insulated on a number of these things compared to uh, compared to lots of other countries, whether they be producers or consumers of grain. Well, also the point about certain countries that rely a lot on food imports um, now being most vulnerable to all of this. And I, I know Egypt uh, is, is the one that was mentioned a, a number of times, but of course there are, are others. And when it comes to food price inflation, this is something we've discussed again, but that is clearly a really sensitive topic for, for consumers and people who have to eat. And it's the kind of thing that tends to um, explode into the political sphere very quickly as well. So I, I think I very briefly mentioned the um, the Egypt bread riots. Uh, I think that was back in 2008. I mean, some people talk about those as a sort of prelude for the Arab Spring entirely. So it's very easy to see food price pressures uh, translate into um, political upheaval as well. Last point, though, it'll be interesting if uh, the White House does anything on those uh, millions of acres that are currently held back. I didn't realize that uh, previously that we have this equivalent of essentially it's not quite a strategic patrol. It's not quite the equivalent of a strategic petroleum reserve because there's nothing to sell into the market immediately. But to make yeah. them uh, make those acres available for planting, I don't know, it doesn't feel like wheat politics uh, you know, create <laughs> havoc for the White House the same way gasoline prices do. But it will be interesting to see if that uh, lever or something similar is pulled at some point. Well, also Scott's point about, you know, even if you just did something relatively small and it's probably not feasible that releasing those reserved acres would suddenly lead to a big boom in supply, but even something small can send a price signal to the market and start bringing them down. Particularly at a time when people, when uh, countries are hoarding, and so yeah. if if there's a lot of excess buying because everyone is nervous, and you're signaling to the market, okay, supply is going to come in September or whenever that comes, that might ease some of the current hoarding now and be able to have a re have a response even before the weed is actually or whatever grain it is is actually grown. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Although maybe the pheasant hunters will get upset. I don't know. How how large is like the pheasant hunting lobby? It'll be really bad if we have to like, like we're not going to do a pheasant hunting. I mean, what if it gets to that point? We're like, <laughs> well, now we have to do a pheasant hunting story. But we'll know it's really bad if that's where we have to like keep, keep, uh, keep going down <laughs> that road. Yeah. All right. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. Okay. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway.
And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Scott Irwin, on Twitter. He's at Scott Irwin UI. Big thanks to our producers, Magnus Henriksen and Colin Tipton. Follow the Bloomberg Head of Podcasts, Francesca Levy, at Francesca Today. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at Podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thank you.